largest wellsprings of mankind. India is two-thirds the size of Europe and its population over 360 million, a racial mosaic making up one-seventh of the entire human race. This is the land of Buddha, the Bengal Lancers, Ganga Din, Mowgli the Jungle Boy, and Shere Khan, the Great Asian Tiger. Bear's first mission is a tour of the huge red fort built on the eastern edge of Delhi in 1638 by Emperor Shah Jahan. Its construction took 10 years, and upon completion, it was the most magnificent edifice in the eastern world. During several ensuing wars and invasions with accompanying looting, many of its treasures were destroyed or stolen. The many ornate and massive buildings within the fort walls, however, retain much of their earlier impressiveness. It is written on the ceiling of the main hall that if there is heaven on earth, it is this. Grassy fields surrounding the fort are mowed with the aid of bullets. This open ground is also useful for drying of freshly dyed silks for which India is noted. Sight to be encountered almost anywhere in or near the towns is the Hindu magician. Fred watches one here, practicing the gentle art of self-levitation. Another ever-present bit of local color are the snake charmers with their deadly charges, the cobras. The cobras are charmed by movements of the body or hands rather than by the music of the gourd flutes. In the open countryside, a great many people succumb each year to cobra venom. A favorite pet in India is Kipling's Riki Tiki Tavi, the mongoose. For this small rodent is a deadly enemy of all snakes, and when given a chance, makes short work of them, as he does here. he has flown so far to hunt. These tiny five-week-old editions of Sher Khan will eventually grow into 10-foot, 500-pound carnivores in a wild state greatly destructive of livestock and not infrequently potential man-killers. The following day, Bear entrains from Delhi some 250 miles to Kota, whence he and his baggage are transferred to a hunting car. After an additional 50-mile drive through a number of small villages, they arrive at Pulsagar, the palace of His Highness the Maharaja of Bundi, who will be Bear's host during the hunt. Pulsagar means Flower Lake, named for the body of water just outside the thick walls. This palace is comparatively new, having been built in 1947 by the present owner. It is constructed of thick masonry in colors of orange and white. The traveler is presented to his highness, and the two men from opposite sides of the world sit in the courtyard to talk things over. Maharaja was educated in England, so of course speaks excellent English. And Bear soon learns that he's an avid hunter of all types of game. His Highness shows great interest in the bow and arrow his guest will use in hunting, and asks many questions concerning its use. In the meantime, the palace retinue, wearing turbans of brilliant orange, which is the Bundi family color, serves tea and other refreshments. Raja then takes his guest on a tour of the palace. The Bundi coat of arms marks the entrance to the trophy room. His Highness, who is a fine marksman, regales Bear with tales of his hunts for leopard, crocodile, and elephants. He has 
also taken many tigers. In the center of the palace, a large pool fed by a stream filtering through the rocks helps to cool the air during a hot season. In the summer months, most of the wild vegetation completely loses its greenery, and the dry fallen leaves are all that most of the animals have to subsist on. Within the palace walls, however, sufficient moisture in the earth keeps vegetation fresh and colorful. Some of the tropical trees and shrubs bear handsome flowers the year round. Beautiful peacocks are plentiful. As any serious bow hunter will, Fred Bear makes sure well before the hunt that his tackle is in readiness. Palace servants bring him a box of hunting arrows and watch intently as he proceeds to sharpen the edges of the steel broadheads with a file. The ferrules of these special heads, designed by Bear himself, are slotted to receive replaceable razor-thin blades. These double the cutting area and effectiveness of the head. Arm and shoulder muscles are limbered up by shooting a few blunt-tipped practice arrows. A special quiver attached to the bow pulls spare arrows while hunting. The Indian clansmen are extremely curious about Fred's hunting tackle. And indeed, this is natural, since their ancestors used this same weapon for hunting and warfare. David Singh, personal aide to his highness, takes the visitor on a tour of the palace grounds atop Rosie the Elephant. Rosie, of course, is a lady elephant and was given her name because of the pink color of her trunk. Her ponderous gait makes the ride much like running through a gale in a small boat. Special handrails are provided on the platform to keep novices from falling off and negotiating sharp corners or sudden stops. find her back a handy spot from which to gather mangoes and other fruits, Rosie used her actual trunk to break off a leafy bough, but not to eat, but to use as a fly swatter. Having put the flies to root, Rosie, who proved to be quite a ham, trumpets triumphantly. Local travel is accomplished almost entirely on foot, the only vehicles present being those of the Maharaja. This is the town of Bundi, not far from the palace. A curbside laundry. An artisan shaping bronze water vessels. And a view of a wedding celebration complete with a colorful band. decorated house is where the ceremonies take place. Seasonal rhythm dominates the life of these people. From October to April, monsoons from the Arabian Sea burst over the land, filling the public water reservoirs and transforming the dry land into a vast expanse of green. In April, the tropical heat begins again and the water reservoirs shrink in volume. From the edge of the village, one has a good view of the ancient Bundi Palace built in 1434. Above the palace on a craggy hill rises the still older fort constructed in 1423. These fortifications were erected in times when a man's neighbors were often his enemies and consequently were built to withstand assault. Some of the masonry walls around the palace and fort are 30 feet thick. The main entrance to the palace is guarded by carved stone elephants over the portal. A more practical defense is seen in the huge spikes protruding from the heavy doors, placed to prevent elephants from attacking force from battering them down. Colored frescoes on the walls seem as fresh as when made some 500 years ago. 
A few caretakers are the only inhabitants of this palace today. From ancient times, the Maharajas were interested in the sciences of astronomy and geography and had equipment for studying the heavens and earth. The palace also contains a museum with a priceless collection of arms and artifacts. An ancient water clock is still constantly attended by the official timekeeper. The Maharaja's father is buried within these walls and a 24-hour guard is posted at his tomb. High over all looms the hulking hilltop fortress, haunted by a thousand ghosts from the battles of the past. The most lively present-day inhabitants of these hallowed grounds are the small Indian gazelles, or chinkara. These dainty creatures are very alert and lightning fast in their reactions, as Bear was to find out later. From the vantage point of the fortress wall, one obtains a magnificent view down over the old palace and across the lake to the sprawling village of Bundi in the valley below. Bundi is the home of some 45,000 clansmen who acknowledge the Maharaja as their leader. There are many places in this country left over from ancient times, some of them completely deserted. But this one is occupied by a host of monkeys who have moved in from the jungle and taken over. They are not disturbed, and food is left for them by local villagers. This little fellow is about two weeks old and commands a lot of attention, as do most animal youngsters his age. There are many temples or shrines scattered about the countryside. As His Highness and guests leave Pool Sagar for a hunting excursion, the palace guard and Rosie honor the clan head with a salute. The hunting car is a jeep which has an extension on the frame and a special customized body. The Bundi orange flag flies from its hood. Jackal moves out of their path as they progress into the Indian jungle, which has a very un-jungle-like appearance because of the lack of green vegetation. This, however, is the dry season, and all the leaves have been shed. The Maharaja is interested in testing the eye of the archer and the power of his bow on lesser game before taking on a tiger. And, as they must wait until a tiger is reported, they may have a week or more to spend doing so. The first day out, the bowman gets a chance for a nilge, or blue bull, one of the world's largest antelope. Their slaty coats blend easily with the desiccated vegetation. These and similar species are not much harassed by humans, and so are not too difficult to approach within arrow range. It is fortunate that this is so, for the sere vegetation is little help in concealing the hunter's approach. arrow finds its mark, and after a short job of tracking, Bear and the native hunter find the large, steely-hued animal. Although one of the largest of antelope, their horns are not prepossessing. The head tracker and skinner, Manwar Lal, is 65 years old and served in this capacity for the Maharaja's father. In his day, he has skinned more than 600 tigers. His equipment consists of an imposing array of wicked knives. He carries no special sharpening stone, preferring to use one picked up at random as the need arises. The flesh of the Nilge is excellent table fare. On another day, the party proceeds again in the hunting car. All eyes alert for any movement of game in the surrounding cover. It 
it is not too long before there's an opportunity to approach within range of a sandbar, a large deer. Again, a well-placed arrow and a short job of tracking results in a fine trophy. This time, it is His Highness who offers congratulations to the bowman. Not as large as the blue bulls, the sandbar nevertheless wears more impressive headgear. It is related to the red deer or stag of Europe, and its range extends throughout India, Sumatra, and Malacca. Time again for a fresh skinning knife to be wetted. The chinkara, or Indian gazelles, were quite plentiful. During the hunt, several arrows were shot at them, but were never able to score, as the fleet gazelles were always gone before the arrows got there. Another time, the bowman stalks the axes, or spotted deer, reputed to be the most beautiful member of the entire deer family. Once again, Bear's shaft finds a target, and the animal runs but a short way before dropping. The color of the axis deer is golden brown with a dark stripe along the back and curved rows of white spots along its sides. Unlike our North American deer, which wear spots only while forms, these lovely animals keep theirs throughout life. These are busy days for the skinner. The full blast of the midday sun is now being felt and the party retreats to the comparative coolness of the palace. They are greeted by the ritual salute from the guards, and of course, Rosie is very much in evidence, trying to steal the show with her trumpeting. Shortly after their return this day, the hunters are excited to learn that a runner from a nearby village has arrived with news of a tiger in the vicinity. Immediately, appropriate ceremonies are started to help ensure success on the forthcoming venture. Local maidens perform a ritual dance to the accompaniment of drums and stringed instruments. Their ankle-length saris and carefully veiled faces are in keeping with the customs of their country. Then the dance is followed by a banquet in which roast wild boar is the main dish. All meat consumed at the palace is some form of wild game. Meals are always followed by a washing of face and hands in a silver bowl. Before the hunt, symbolic gunpowder effigies of the tiger are burned to ensure his defeat. All preparations and precautions made, the hunters set forth to where the tiger had been seen on the bait. These baits are put out beforehand in carefully selected spots near water, so the tiger, when thirsty, will not have to venture too far from his kill. At the same time, machons, or tree platforms, are built, from which the hunters can see through shooting lanes cleared in the brush. The local villagers are eager to serve as beaters. If the hunt is successful, their reward comes through the safety of their cattle and goats, with one more predator out of the way. Tigers have been known to kill 60,000 head of cattle and 4,000 human beings in one year. His Highness makes sure everyone understands what he is to do, so there will be no slip-ups. The hunters then walk in over the rocky ground to their positions, while the beaters quietly circle out to approach from the far side of the bait. Many types of game would be difficult to surround in this way, but not so the tiger. After gorging on meat during the night, he lies dormant in the nearest shade all day. Being used to the sight and smell of humans, he pays them little heed unless they get too close to him. Bear climbs up on the machan nearest the cover and His Highness and the photographer occupy other machans some 30 yards behind him. The drive begins on the distant hillside, with natives advancing slowly through the forest, yelling, hurling stones, and beating the trees with sticks. Occasionally, when it can be made to operate, an ancient musket is fired. racket 
quite naturally disturbs the tiger's siesta and drives him from his lair. The beaters at no time during the hunt see the animal as the din keeps it moving well ahead of them. But they know their best protection is plenty of noise, so there's no slackening of effort. The tiger crosses the nearby stream, but hearing beaters out in front of him changes directions once and then again, becoming confused and worried by the approaching sounds on three sides of him. The big cat lies down in the stream to cool off, but the firing of a musket immediately starts him moving again, and now he heads uphill toward the Mashans. Bear, seeing a tiger through an opening some distance away, is at first reluctant to shoot, but realizing that the animal may get no closer, decides to risk it. Luck is really with him, for his arrow flies straight down the opening and passes completely through the tiger. The beast flashes into heavier cover, but the hunter is sure it is mortally wounded as the hair-raising roars and growls quickly fade away. Shortly after the beaters come through, Bear and a tracker make their way into the center of the thicket and find the tiger dead just a short distance from where the hunter's arrow had overtaken it. It is a great and satisfying thrill for the bowman to examine this magnificent striped marauder whose powerful jaws are capable of breaking the neck of a bullock. Everyone is in high spirits over this sudden success, and Bear is not the least of them. Evening is fast approaching as the tiger, lashed to a stout pole, is carried out of the hills into open country where it can be photographed. Fortune has really smiled on the hunter this day, and his step is light as he leads the procession down out of the rocks. It is hard to know just what the villagers think of all this, but judging from the many wide smiles, they are genuinely happy over the success of the hunt. Indian elephants and tigers are ancestral enemies, and Rosie takes her opportunity to wreak vengeance on Shere Khan, then trumpets victoriously. Word of such an event spreads rapidly, and at each village on the return trip to the palace, time out must be taken while the women gather round the tiger for a victory dance, after which his highness rewards them with rupees. Once back at Pool Cigar, there's just time to carefully skin the trophy and stretch the beautifully marked hide to dry before evening. The hunter accepts final congratulations from his highness. The time has come to leave, and Bear reluctantly bids his host goodbye. The Maharaja presents him with a Bundi dagger, a family heirloom used by his forebears over 300 years ago. Beautiful floral garlands are also given to him. Rosie, not to be outdone, makes her own presentation. A conclusion fitting this fabulous journey to the land of the tiger.